Hello, I'm Pam Powers with the Office of Assessment and Accountability, and this is the K-PREP training for Spring 2020. This is the last year we'll be doing a full paper administration of the K-PREP. So for those of you who have lots and lots of boxes arrive, this will be the last time you have to find a place to store all those and to ship all those materials back. For those of you that have done this in the past, this will be a refresher. For those of you who are new, it will be the last time you'll have to learn this. So let's get started and look at the K-PREP. We're going to start with operational testing. Who takes the K-PREP? Well, if you are a Kentucky Public School student in grades 3 through 8, 10 or 11, you will take the K-PREP. Now there are a few exceptions to that rule, so let's first look at our exceptions. If you are an alternate assessment student, you will take the alternate K-PREP rather than the K-PREP. If you've skipped a grade, you won't take the test for the grade you skipped. If you're enrolled at a job course center, you will not test. The most common reason students do not test is that they have a medical or extraordinary circumstance non-participation. Those have to be filled out and put into SDRR, which if you want details on that, please refer to the DACBAC manual or the SDRR training module. Also, if your students, if you have students that were expelled without services, they will not test. But if you expel a student with services, they must be tested. Now when we say we everyone test, we also test all students with disabilities. They are allowed accommodations based on their IEP, 504 plan, or program services plan. We also test students that are retained, foreign exchange students. So if you had done this in the past and we did not test foreign exchange students, that has now changed. Any student that moves into the state during testing, ex we expect to be tested. Students that have a minor medical emergency. Some of you would remember this more as a medical emergency. That is a form that you will fill out. And it is springtime. Perhaps the child has broken their arm and would need a scrap. That would be a minor medical emergency. They do not have a, an IEP or a 504 plan. Our first year EL students must test as well, but they are only required to test in math and science and only for participation. What does participation mean? Participation means they must answer for multiple choice or one extended response. And this is only for a first year EL student. If you're a second year or higher, then you're expected to test with whatever supports are in place with your plan. Now the K-PREP has both common and matrix testing items. What are the common items? Common items mean that everyone is getting exactly the same test items. Now that limits us on how much of the curriculum that we can actually test because we're not going to sit there and test every student for the next several hours. So common testing lets us, everyone have the same item but doesn't cover as much as the curriculum. Now science has changed. Science has common items and matrix items. The matrix items allow testing across the curriculum in science. So it could be I get a life science item and you get an earth science item. So we're not exactly having all of the same items. But speaking of science, that's grades four and seven. It has its own test booklet. It's a combined booklet where the student not only reads the question in the booklet, they answer in the booklet. Now this is different from K-PREP because K-PREP has a test booklet and a student response booklet. So when we look at the combined booklet for science, we'll notice we're going to write the answers in the test booklet. There is a demographic page. That means that all of the information of the school and the student ID and all of that information has to be bubbled in on the student combined booklet if the student doesn't have a pre-printed booklet. There's also an honor code page 
That is the back page of the science booklet. Now with the honor code, a student has a choice of not signing it. If they choose not to, science, to, to sign it, testing moves on. But since this is on the back page of the science booklet, please don't rip it off the back of the book if they choose not to sign it. We need that last page. Now, as you're testing, you're gonna test reading and math, and then pull both of those booklets back and give the students in grades four and seven their science booklet. There are four forms of the science test, unlike the K prep and the other subject areas, which only has one form. So if you have to replace a booklet for science, make certain you are grabbing the correct form of the book. Now, where are you going to find that material? In the school overage or the DAC overage. And if you still don't have the correct form, then the DAC will order the K prep materials that are needed. Now you have several different item types in science. You have the multiple choice and the extended response, which is normal. You see that in all the K prep items, but it also has multiple select. So for science, you have one more type of item. So what are we going to do to prepare for all this? Well, let's take a look at our schedule. January and February have already come and gone. So by this point, you've already ordered accommodated materials. You've selected your shipping option. And you're going to hear me talk about shipping option one, two, and three. So many things are dependent upon which shipping option that you have chosen. In March and April, you'll start receiving your materials from Pearson. And that's based on which shipping option you chose. We ask that you inventory the materials as soon as possible, because if something is missing, we need to know about it. Because part of that shipping list, that packing list that comes in, says you may have received, it says it's you, they shipped you three boxes, you have two. You need to let them know immediately that you only received two. Or perhaps you received the, a box for school down the road. You need to let them know that. Now in April and June, if you're the DAC, you're going to be distributing those materials to your schools. And they're going to have to store those materials. Also, we have lots of students that change schools. So you may need to order additional materials. But before you place an additional material order, please pull from the school overage and the DAC overage. As the DAC, you're also going to assist your schools with the testing schedule. For many of our established schools, you already have a testing schedule that you like, that's worked well for you in the past, and you usually just wind up tweaking it a bit based on time. That's fine. If you've worked out a schedule that works well for you, please continue to use it. Now you will be doing your rosters in SDRR, and if you have any non-participation requests, you'll need to put those in SDRR. Please enter those as soon as possible and then check the next day to make certain that they haven't requested additional information. With non-participation requests, if no one supplies additional information, when it closes in June, it will automatically be denied. And you'll have to go back through the same process, process again in August when it reopens, if you still need that non-participation request. Now remember I mentioned shipping options? Well you'll receive your materials based on which shipping option that you have chosen. If you chose option one, you'll receive them on March 23rd that week, option two, April 6th, option three, April the 20th. You'll receive both regular and accommodated materials. They come to the district office or where your DAC has chosen to send them. Now they come pre-packaged, there is a packing list, and that is what you're going to double check. If you are a school, you have a 5% overage, a district or the DAC receives a 3% overage. These are secure test materials, so please remember to keep them secure, keep them locked. If you're going to store any test materials in a classroom, it must be double locked. 
inventory these materials as soon as possible, please keep your original boxes because you're going to use those boxes to return your test materials. If you need additional materials, now is a good time to start ordering. And you always check your overage before you place an order. If you need additional shipping materials, such as additional boxes or labels or header sheets, anything that deals with shipping, you can also order those additional materials at the same time. Who orders additional materials? That is the DAC. So if you are a school person, please get those requests into your DAC in the morning so that they can get the materials all put together and ordered before 1.30 so that they can get them the next day. Now you can request additional materials through June 3rd. Hopefully no one's still testing at that point since we've been really light on snow this year. If you're the DAC, you can order uh, per school per grade in a single day. You can also order additional shipping materials until June 12th. Now remember if your items came in and they were packed to the top on those boxes, when we give those materials to our students, they seem to grow. So something that was this big all of a sudden is this big. You may need additional uh, boxes to ship in. So if you, your materials barely fit in the boxes you received, you may go ahead and order a couple of extra boxes for yourself. Now what's the timetable on all this? You'll notice we have shipment option one, two, and three of when you can start ordering additional orders for regular and accommodating materials and shipping materials. If you're shipping shipment option one, you can start on March 23rd. And shipment option two starts on April 6th and April 20th for the last shipping option three. Now you have seven calendar days after the last day of testing to get scorable items packed and shipped. That's you have five days of testing and then from that point forward you have seven calendar days. What are, what's a calendar day? That's weekends, holidays, days you're not in school for whatever reason. If it's on the calendar we count that day. So take that into consideration when you're packing or when you're doing makeups. If you have non-scorable materials you can ship those nine calendar days after the last day of testing. But here's the secret. If you have everything ready to go, when you have your scorable materials in that first seven days, if your non-scorables are ready to go, ship them all at the same time. Get them out of your hair. If you don't have, if you don't have time to pack your non-scorables, then you still have two more days to do it and you can ship them. So in Pearson Access Next, your original ordering of accommodated materials and checking the enrollment counts that we had opened on January 17th. It's now closed. So at this point, once your materials roll in, you're going to check those and order any additional materials that you may need. Now this particular page is a new page for us. Every single one of these icons is actually a live link. So if we go to that very first one, the KPREP resources, that takes us to the KPREP page on the KDE website. Now this is the KPREP page on the KDE website. You'll notice we have the notification box. I usually hit close on this to turn it off. Now once you hit close, here's another secret for you. It won't come back for 24 hours. So let's hit close so that as we go through the website, we don't have to deal with the extra space that box takes. Now on the KPREP page, you will find information about the KPREP, the field test as well. And you'll notice as we go down here on that right hand side, we have information about field testing first because that's what's occurring first. As we pass the field test, most of this information will go away. In the middle there, we see important dates for spring 2020 testing. You'll want to grab these documents if you haven't already. 
because they give you all the dates that are pertinent to shipping and testing everything you can think of. It also has the blueprint, testing item formats and times, which here's a look at that particular PDF. One of your slides in this KPREP presentation has this as well. This gives you all the content areas and times and number of items. Let's go back over to the KPREP page. One last thing I want, well, several more things to point out here. You'll notice we have perform performance level descriptors, KPREP reference sheets, on-demand writing, scoring guides. All of that is available to use now. And yes, the reference sheets are the same ones that will be sent to you in your shipping. But you need to use the ones that came in shipping with the actual test. But if you want to use a copy of that in your classroom beforehand, you can. And here's where you find that information. You also have forms that are available. If you are a DAC, you have a certification of proper test administration to complete and return after testing. If you're a BAC, you also have one that you will return to your DAC. It's only the DAC certification that KDE asked to have returned. We do ask that you keep those forms on file in your district in case there are any questions. The last thing I want to point out here is the rubrics and writers reference sheets for spring 2021. That's right, spring 2021, next year. These actually worked with the field tests for this year, but these will come into play next year. So you've got that information, but don't worry about using it for this spring. Now let's return to our PowerPoint. As we look at this slide, You'll notice that most of the things we saw on the KPREP page, like the blueprint, the text help samplers, there'll be manuals coming up, the DAC back guide, the test administration manuals. Uh, the DAC email icon actually takes you to a different page where you can get links to all the DAC emails and special DAC emails. The things in gold here, PAN and online practice tests and tutorials. PAN is the Pearson Access Next site. If we were still under the field test, you could find all your field tests here. If we passed on, passed the field test, or you're only elementary and middle school, uh, you won't be going back into PAN. But your DAC will, because that is where you will go to order additional materials. One thing that's new is the non-standard response template for Google Docs. We've had this request for several years to create a non-standard response template that could be used on a Chromebook. We finally worked out the issues with that, and so you can get that off the KPREP page. Now that we've looked at where we can go get resources, let's look at scheduling. Here is our testing times and items chart. Remember we saw this just a moment ago. So if you click on this, big icon, it will actually take you out there to that chart. So you can get one that you can print off. Now when you're scheduling, testing must be five consecutive instructional days during the last 14 instructional days of the district calendar. If you've already watched the SDRR training, you will have noticed that there's a separate window for elementary, middle, and high school. Some districts choose to have the same window for all three levels. Others choose to have one level different or all three, level dif all three levels different. They all have to fall within those last 14 instructional days. You will choose five in consecutive days to do the testing. Let's look at an elementary level, for example. Let's say elementary A. We're going to test Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That's the window that we chose. My school chooses to start testing on Monday. The elementary school down the road says, mm, I don't want to start testing till Tuesday. Okay, you can do that. But now, 
the elementary down the road has four days to test because as an elementary school, our window is exactly the same. So our elementary window was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If I choose not to test on Monday, I'm left with the last four days. So I've shorted myself one day. That's strictly up to you. Also, if we are on separate campuses, we do not have to have the exact same schedule. It could be that my school chooses to do reading A and B today, but your school chooses only to do reading A. That's okay. We're on separate campuses. We can do that. Do whatever schedule works well for you. Also, sometimes we have it where maybe we don't want to start testing our third graders on Monday. We want to wait till Tuesday. And since they're only doing reading and math, we say we can do that in four days. That's fine. Use whatever schedule works best for your school. But if you choose to test third grade today, all third graders must do exactly the same content areas. Now, when you have breaks between your content areas, you might have a stand and stretch break, or maybe you have a break for lunch. You need to have appropriate monitoring during all of those. It's very quick and easy for someone to grab a cell phone and take a picture of materials, especially when we're doing a stand and stretch break because many times we don't take those materials up. And when everyone's standing up, you really cannot see what's going on. So be aware of that for when it comes to monitoring. So if you're going to have a very long break at all, you're going to take those materials up. What about extended time? Yes, if a student gets extended time, time and a half or double time, you'll need to build that into a schedule for that student. Now, they must have a current IEP 504 plan or program service plan to get extended time, unless it's a medical emergency and they could have extended time as part of a medical emergency. When you do makeups, we suggest that you do makeups as soon as possible. Don't wait until the five days are over. If a student isn't there in the morning and you're testing in the morning, but they come in by noontime, you could start testing in the afternoon with that student. So as soon as you can, start scheduling your makeups. Because remember, you have to get these materials packed and shipped seven days after the final day of your testing window. You're also going to do seating charts. Your seating chart could be for the group or it could be for an individual. We do have some samples there on the KPREP page again that you can get to for groups or for individuals. Or it could be that your room is completely different and you draw it out yourself. Whatever works best for you, please continue to do that. Some also choose to use the same seating chart for almost every content area. They just make a notation on the page if a student's absent or someone has come in and when that was. But this is a local decision. It could be that you've decided to use a new seating chart with every content area. That's okay as well. Now, if a student leaves the session early, maybe they become ill, then the proctor needs to note the time the student left because the student can then come back in a makeup session and continue from that point forward with the, whatever time they had left. Now what they couldn't do is if they left for a reason maybe we would see this more at high school would be a student leaving to get go for a driver's test something like that. That's not an excused absence to be able to come back and finish the test. Now, if the student is leaving because they have a doctor's appointment, then yes, they could come back and finish the test in the amount of time that's left. Now, if you know that's going to happen, we would suggest that they not start the test at all, but that they take it all on a makeup at that point. But we all know sometimes you don't know about it and mom or dad comes to pick up the student in the middle of the test. You just have to note the time and they can finish the test. So what goes on with testing activities? 
Well, we have all kinds of resources available. And guess where these are? These are on the KPREP page. The extended response and short answer guides, uh, the writing scoring criteria, pre-writing areas. So all of this is available to you right now on the KPREP page. We do want to remind you that there is no scratch paper for on-demand writing because they do all of their pre-write in the test booklet. So what does a school provide? Well, it's up to you to provide calculators. And many of you are very good at having entire boxes of calculators ready to go. Some schools even have what we call a calculator uh, party and put fresh batteries in all the calculators in preparation for today's testing. Now, if you have uh, grades four and seven, we are going to need some protractors and angle rulers available. And you will also need to provide a dictionary or thesaurus for students taking the on-demand writing. Now, what's Pearson going to provide? Well, they're going to give you the reference sheets, the math reference sheets and the writer's reference sheets. And they're going to give you rulers. And yes, you may keep all of these. You don't have to return any of these. The rulers. Please do not take a pair of scissors and cut off the ruler. That is changing the test instrument itself. Because part of learning to read a ruler is to know where zero is and read from there. So don't do anything to change the rulers. Now the rulers are yours to keep once the testing's over and if you feel like cutting them off after testing, go ahead. The calculator use policy it is usually updated every year. You can go ahead and check it to make certain that any calculators that you're using or that a student wants to use, maybe a personal calculator, is okay with the policy. There are some prohibited calculators on there. Some of the things that you do need to know is if it has a computer algebraic system, that must be turned off. Anything that would talk to the internet or through another calculator, that would need to be turned off as well. But check out the calculator use policy for details. So what's unapproved? Anything that Pearson sends to you to use, the reference sheets, the rulers, you'll use those. But you can't use ink pens or highlighters. The system cannot score something that's been filled in with an ink pen. So if you have that issue going on, you're going to consult your DAC back guide and it's going to tell you how to take care of that. Now cell phones, smartphones, electronic devices, smart watches, all kinds of things like this. Anything that will talk to the internet, guess what? We can't have those around test materials. So those need to be put away while we're testing. Some schools choose to uh, put their cell phone in a basket, line them up along the board, whatever works best for your school. Others have said that, well, our parents really want our, chi our children to keep their uh, cell phones on them. If putting it in their backpack that's underneath their desk doesn't work, you can always take a Ziploc bag, put the cell phone in the Ziploc bag, close it, put a piece of tape on it, and then it can lay there on the desk. And you'll hear the tape go rip if somebody tries to open it. So that's one way you can keep the cell phone with the student. But the big thing to take from all this, if it talks to the internet, it must be turned off. So the test booklet is separate, except for science, from the student response booklet. So the test booklet, they can use their pencil to underline lightly. You can have a blank color overlay, that's fine. All students can have that. Blank writing or graph paper. Many people choose to use graph paper. That way, if they need it in math, they have it. And then you can't have any kind of paper, though, for on-demand writing. That is the one place you can't have it. So what are we reminding teachers about? That you must follow the directions in the test administration manual. Please read the script as it is written. That means all of it. Because that's part of 
keeping everything on track. Another thing is that we have teachers at least two or three classrooms where they pass out pre-printed booklets without paying attention to which student is getting which booklet. So if that happens, then we have to try to recreate and give the correct student the correct booklet, which means we're going to have a lot of booklet replacements. What we learned from an elementary teacher several years ago was if it doesn't move, put your name on it. So when you pass out materials, make certain they have put their name on their test booklet, their student response booklet, and their scratch paper. If it doesn't move, put your name on it, because if something happens and booklets get switched, we'll be able to figure out what we need to have transcribed and what doesn't. Now this has happened even with students that are being accommodated in a small group situation where they have given the wrong booklets to the wrong two kids. So be very careful about what name is on the book when you pass them out. The very last thing on this slide talks about classroom walls, floors, blinds, etc. Get rid of all the content. Get rid of all the posters. Yes. We have to because it got a little crazy. We had posters on the walls and posters on the ceiling and posters on the floor and desks that were ordered that had content on them, t-shirts that had content on them. So that all had to go away. So we have a clean classroom or some people choose to do it in the gymnasium or a cafeteria, wherever you're testing. It doesn't matter what the room is, even if, it's, if you're testing in a hallway. It cannot have content on the walls. And that includes anything that's painted on the walls. That would have to be covered up. Now the test booklet has a security barcode on it. Remember when I was telling you about you need to check everything that's been shipped to you? Check that packing list? Because this barcode is how Pearson tracks test booklets. And so if they think they sent you 30 booklets, these particular 30 booklets, they expect to get those same 30 booklets back. So make certain that when you do your list that you check to make certain that you have the barcodes that they say you do. Now your science booklets, now remember that's the combined booklets, will have a barcode if it's not a pre-printed booklet. And you'll notice that this is on the back page. How do I know that? Because the student honor code is on the back page of the combined booklet. And remember, we're not going to rip off this back cover if the student decides not to sign it. What happens if you need to replace a test booklet? Well, test booklets, that's the test booklet and the combined booklet, have secure test items in them. So you can't just destroy it. You've got to contact Pearson first, and they're going to ask for the school, school and district name, the grade, and the security barcode. If you're replacing the booklet because it was soiled by bodily fluids, you're not going to return that booklet to Pearson. Yes, and once upon a time I understand that they used to put it in a Ziploc bag and return it. We don't do that anymore. So you will need to contact Pearson first to get all of the information and they will tell you when you can destroy it. Now what some people wind up doing is because this has a barcode on it, they take that barcode and they add it as an annotation in SDRR of the book that they destroyed and the book that they gave the student. That way they have a record of it. Should anyone ask and say, well, you didn't return such and such book, you can say, no, you told us to destroy it, and we did. So this gives you a, an electronic copy that you can have on every student. The student combined booklet has the same, you treat it the same as you do the test booklets. But it has one more thing that you have to send Pearson. What form of the test? So if you have to replace a combined booklet, you're going to need the form number. So what don't you use? Please don't give a pre-printed student response booklet to another student. If you do, then you're going to be transcribing. Only use number two pencils. That's not a mechanical pencil. That's not a liquid pencil. That's just the plain old number two pencil. No highlighters, no ink pens, no staples or glue. 
hmm, staples or glue? Why would I need staples or glue? If you have students doing non-standard responses, uh, they're typing their, their answer into the computer and then you're cutting it out, you're going to tape it into the booklet. You're never going to use staples or glue because that will gum up the works when they do a high-speed scan on these test on these uh, response booklets and it will probably destroy the answers. So don't have any staples or glue anywhere near your test materials. So student response booklets, you're going to use them. A pre-printed student response booklet, hopefully most of your students have that. If it's correct, if the information is correct on it, you're going to use it. If it's not, you're going to void the student response booklet and you're going to take a big black marker and write void across it so you don't try to use it again. And then you're going to give them a new student response booklet. You will have some students that do not have pre-printed booklets, so you're going to have to grid all that information in. All of the gridding information is part of the script in the TAN. So don't forget to read all of that because students can bubble in their own answers and their own demographics. So let's see what demographics are pre-printed on the label. Well, the SSID, the date of birth, gender, the district and school code, first name, last name, school name, all of that information is part of the pre-printed booklet. If any of this is incorrect, you cannot use the student response booklet and you will have to void it. What we tell you is to make certain that the information in in front of the campus is correct because that is our authoritative source. So every year we have some students that names have changed. Maybe they were adopted since uh, January when the files were pulled and they have a new name. So you would void their student response booklet and bubble in the demographics with their new name. If you have to replace a student response booklet for any reason, you're going to have to transcribe answers into a new one if the student had already begun answering. Now there is a serial number on the front of the student response booklet. And the same way as with the test booklet, you can put that serial number in SDRR as an annotation if you had to replace your student response booklet. Now the original student response booklet, you're going to securely destroy. If you didn't need it, you're going to write void across it so you know which ones that you can destroy. There's no need to contact Pearson to destroy a student response booklet. Now what's on the student response booklet with demographics? The normal name, birthday, gender, but one of the things you will need to bubble in is box number five, accommodated materials if the student received accommodated materials, audio, braille, large print, or use the text reader. So box five only applies if your student received accommodated materials. Now box six, the room number where the student tested, you will have to fill that in for every student. And the students can do that, that is part of the script. The student combined booklet for science looks very much like the student response booklet on this demographic page. Now there are four forms of the science test for each grade. You'll notice that the form on the screen is form number two. So if I have to replace this, I have to find form number two to replace it with. Room numbers. Most of you already have a crosswalk for room numbers. It must be a four digit room number. No alpha characters allowed. And if your school does not have four digit rooms, then most of you have padded it with leading zeros. So it would be zero, zero, one, zero, or whatever works for your particular rooms. So we can't have any letters, only numbers. Keep this crosswalk because you also use these room numbers not only on the booklets, but on your seating charts as well, so that we know which room it is. So if there's ever any questions or allegations, you will have to pull out that crosswalk for us to tell us which room number this is. 
And speaking of seating charts, you can use a single seating chart for multiple sessions. You can use a group seating chart or an individual seating chart depending on the situation in the room. And the templates are available on the KDE website. The student honor code, you will be reading this as part of the script to the students. This is for the K prep and for the science. If the students in grades four and seven that are taking science will see the student honor code twice because they will also see it on their combined booklet. And please don't remove this last page from the booklet if a student decides not to sign the honor code. We go ahead and move on if they decide not to sign it. So collecting the materials, when you're passing out the materials, depending on your school, it could be that, you, that all the teachers come to one central location to check out the materials and then to check in the materials. Others have it where someone comes to their classroom door with materials to give them for testing and then they come back to pick them up after testing. It's whatever works best in your school. There's not one solution for this. Now, remember we're assessment, we trust no one. You should be the same way when it comes to secure materials. If they say that they are giving you 30 books, double check that yes, you are getting 30 books. Many times on the check-in, back to the back, you're matching name by name, not just 30 books. Whatever process you've worked out that works well in your school and district, please continue to use that. What are we going to remind students about? Well, they always want to say administration code, yes, but electronic devices, no electronic devices, no cameras, no internet. Testing should just be testing. You shouldn't be talking to anybody else. That's even after you've turned your materials in, if there are still people testing in the room, you should not have any electronic devices. Remind them that we really don't want to see test materials popping up, pictures of them on Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or whatever the um, social media du jour is. We see that every year. So please remind them not to take pictures and share those materials or text things. So we've tested, now what? Well, this is the last year we have to deal with all these paper materials, so we need to pack. So, packing. We're gonna get the materials from the backs. We're gonna put, give it all to, back to our back and we're gonna verify that Yes, those are the materials I gave you, and the back will double check that. And the back then will return all those materials into the DAC. Now when I say that, it depends on your district. Some have appointments that they set up and they take their materials to the central office and return their materials that way. Whatever process your DAC's worked out, make certain you know what it is, because the DAC is the one who has to contact UPS to get the shipping. So they're gonna ship the scorable and non-scorable materials. And there are detailed instructions on how to do this in the DAC back manual, which is, guess where? The K-Prep page. Now what else are you going to do? You've packed it, and it's back to your DAC, and they're gonna ship it. Don't forget the rosters. We've gotta do the rosters in SDRR. We wanna get as much correct this spring as we can. Because we all know when this reopens in August, school has, is starting, we don't have time. Ha, do we remember what we did in the spring? Maybe not. So everything that you can do now, please do now. Now test irregularities. Hopefully you won't have any, but it has ha happened that sometimes you do. If so, your DAC's going to tell you and give you the forms that you're going to need to gather the statements and data and then the DAC will be the one who enters it into the online allegation system. There is a new system this year that your DAC will know more about. Now we mentioned the non-participation forms, the medical and extraordinary circumstance. You will put these in SDRR. Just filling one out is not an automatic acceptance. 
it has to be approved in SDRR. If it's not approved, we expect the student to test. Now the medical emergency. You will not put the medical emergency information in SDRR, but you will keep the form on file the same as you do your medical and extraordinary circumstance non-participation. Now what can I have on a medical emergency? Hmm. Well, it is springtime. I'm sliding into home and I break my arm. Hmm. That was my dominant hand I just broke. So what kind of accommodation do you think I should have? Well, I'm probably going to need a scribe. Maybe I was a fifth grader because I had on-demand writing to take as well. Yes, you could give them a scribe. Maybe they would need additional time as well because they're not accustomed to using any other accommodation. What we've seen in the middle school, though, is that the middle school student may look at you and go, but I can bubble with this other hand. Okay. We can let you bubble with your other hand. And I can use this hand to type on the computer. So that student could have a non-standard response template for short answers, extended response, and on-demand writing. What else do you think they're going to need? Hmm, probably extended time. Most likely double time, depending on how fast they can type with that other hand. So be flexible in the accommodations that you give on a medical emergency. If you have questions about it, feel free to call us and we will talk you through it. So let's return all these paper items. But there's some things we don't return, like the DAC back manual, the TAMS. Pearson doesn't need those. They already have them. There's a security checklist. They don't need that as well. The school ID header sheets, extra paper bands, reference sheets, rulers, those types of things, scratch paper, none of that goes back to Pearson. If you have unused student response booklets and scratch paper, you are going to securely destroy those. Now, does that mean you at the school or you at the district level? That's your decision, DAC, how you want to do it. Many times you are doing the scratch paper at the school level, but you have the unused student response booklets brought back when you do the packing so that you can do the destroying of them. It's whatever works best in your situation. So the voided materials, it, you could have voided a uh, student response booklet because it had incorrect ID information. It could have been damaged or soiled. Uh, or some reason that the original needed be, to be replaced. So you're going to void them and destroy them based on the directions that are in the DAC back and the TAMS. So it's in both places. The only thing we don't want back is anything soiled with bodily fluids. If it's a test book or the combined book, you're going to contact Pearson first and give them all that information. And when they say you can, destroy it, you can. Now for a student response booklet that's been damaged by bodily fluids or even the combined booklet, you're going to need to transcribe those answers. Sorry, but you'll need to transcribe them before the booklet's destroyed. And if you have questions about that, you can always call or email us and we'll walk you through it. Now I mentioned the sh return shipping header sheet and for most of you, this should look very familiar. Hmm. It, the only difference between this one and the one from last year is the date, the 2020. So if you've got any 2019 or 2018 or 2017, you get my drift. Uh, header sheets well, still laying around. Please go ahead and destroy those because we only want the 2020. Otherwise, we might get a little confused. Now, the 2020 will come pre-printed with your district and school name you will need to fill in the number of answer documents in the grade that is going behind this header sheet. Speaking of which, how do we pack these? I really like the graphics. I'm a visual person myself. And you'll notice that we take the school ID header and then we take the grade 
the student answer booklets and we put a paper band around them. And then we do the next grade and the next grade and so on. You don't have to do one grade per box. So if I can get fourth grade and fifth grade in the same box, I can do that. Now there will be a different header sheet for your student, uh, the combined booklets for science. You'll have that under a separate header sheet. And this is also detailed, not only the same graphic here in your DAC back manual, but also in words as well. Now your non-scorables. Hmm, what's non-scorables? Let's see, that would be the test booklets. And any unused combined booklets, those are non-scorables. Because remember, we are not returning unused or voided student answer booklets or student response booklets only things that have test items in them. So if you've had to void a student combined booklet, it still goes back in the non-scorable box. What about your DAC overage? You're going to put everything back in the box that you didn't use. Hopefully you have used most of it and maybe you have nothing left to pack. That's a good thing. But you will, as the DAC, pack up anything that you have left over. Now this bright red scorable box label, yes, I know it says 2018. It has not changed. And if you look closely, I believe it said 2017 originally. This has not changed. and You will get a bright red label to put on your scorable boxes. And you'll notice that it has school box, and you put one of however many, and then the district will count as well. And your non-scorable boxes get a bright blue label. And this also hasn't changed. So bright, bright blue label for your non-scorables. Now, one of the things I want to show you here is the white UPS scorable return label. And yes, it says scorable on it, but if your eyes are like mine, that's getting a little harder to read. So, one of the things I check is the address. Is it going to Cedar Rapids, Iowa? Ah, good. And is it next day air? Because all of your scorables are going back next day air. Non-scorables do not go back next day air. Only your scorables. So these are the labels that you will put on all of your scorable items. And your scorable boxes have the bright red labels and they have these scorable labels on them. So UPS is the carrier. As the DAC, you will contact UPS for the pickup. You have seven calendar days after the five-day testing window closes to get your scorables packed and shipped. And you have nine days for your non-scorables. But if your non-scorables are ready to go at the same time your scorables are, ship them all. Get all that paper out of your hair. If you run into issues, you can always call Pearson. They are in their office from 7 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And here is their contact number, 888-437-1430. Many of us have that almost written on our hands. We've said that number so many times. But they will help you if you get books that are soiled or you don't have materials and you've ordered them and they haven't shown up. Please go ahead and contact Pearson. They will talk to you. If you have further questions or would just like to talk to us, we are available in the Division of Assessment and Accountability Support by phone or by email. And we man this Monday through Friday. And there's usually someone here from 7.30 to at least 4.30 or 5. So thank you for listening. And don't forget to listen to the rest of these training modules for this year's spring testing.